Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Welcome back to Celebrating Act 2. Here we are again with my partner, John Coleman, and our favorite gourmet, the virtual gourmet, John Mariani. Hi, John. Hello, hello, hello. John, uh, you and I, you have been kind enough to invite me on many of your um, uh, writing assignments where you will, when you come out to the West Coast, you'll make a, a round of uh, great restaurants. Mm -hmm. And I've been fortunate enough to join you for many great meals at many, many wonderful restaurants. And I noticed that, um, I, I can't think of the, the, the specific uh, restaurant, but I did notice that it's very common for a really big name, a nationally known chef, uh, not to be at the restaurant. He he, uh, he creates the menu, he sets it up, um, hires the staff, ensures that it's always up to his standards, uh, but you'll never see him at the restaurant. It's not a mom and pop. We had talked uh, in one, uh, one video we talked about... Um, mom and pop restaurants, trattorias and bistros, things like that. Uh, this, this phenomenon is the, um, the famous chef who starts a group, right, with lots of money, and they open up a dozen different restaurants, all of them wonderful, all of them with different cuisine, but the chef is really an executive chef. He kind of supervises, uh, puts his touch on it. He's not behind the counter. Certainly he's not in the kitchen, uh, unless, let's say, on occasion, John Mariani is coming in to review the uh, the restaurant, and he might fly make in. a point of being there and come to the table to say hello. Well, the key here is that they weren't always famous. And what happens is that people like me and the other media create these guys into well-known chefs, famous chefs, and then the corporations come calling, and then the Food Network wants to do a show, and then they are taken out of their kitchens and never, ever go back in. And the idea, the, the, the constantly quoted idea goes back to Paul Bocuse, the late uh, French master chef from uh, Lyon, who had three Michelin stars and was widely revered, and then he got wind of what being famous and rich was like and he'd go off and he'd be on the Riviera at some convention or he'd be in Las Vegas he opened a restaurant in in Disney World and so forth and Bocuse and some of his colleagues never were there so it was often asked of him well I mean who's cooking the food when you're not there and he says the same person who cook it when I am there see but that's a dodge it's very disingenuous because Knowing a lot of cooks, uh, including my, my one, one of my sons was a cook on the line at some two or three star restaurants in New York. They said when the chef owner is there, it's a different, different restaurant. Does that mean that he overcook he, my son or any other cook, overcooks the risotto when the chef's not there because he's just being lackadaisical? No, it's because you have the spirit of the guy who set this up and who made it in his image, he's the one who's there. It's like going to the Last Supper and Christ doesn't show up. Well, we'll just have a nice dinner, you know? Um, <laughs> you know That's a hell of, an a hell of an analogy. Okay, right? so we'll have a Savior. You know? So, but <clears throat> this is more to the point. Tell me one other industry where the head guy, I don't mean the CEO of the... Uh, of, uh, uh, um, Gates or anything like that, but where the head guy of a company or an industry rather is not there when that industry is going full tilt. To wit, you go to the, the uh, Hollywood Bowl to see a concert by the uh, Los Angeles Philharmonic Orchestra, and you're sitting there, and the all the uh, musicians come out and sit down, clap, and, and then they begin because there's no conductor. The conductor has not chosen to show up. Now, we're dealing with the best musicians on the face of the earth. They know what to do. They can all read music. They know when the downbeat comes. They just play Beethoven's third, right? How bad could it be? Why do you need a conductor then at all? Well, the fact is, 
you do. Take a Yankees are playing L.A., okay? Or the Giants are playing L.A. or whoever plays L.A. And uh, in hockey or baseball, you think that the general manager is simply out to dinner? I mean, no. Uh, you know, so name any other industry where this happens, where a guy says, well, you know, my, my players uh, or my musicians, they play just as well as when I'm not there as, as when I am there. No, because uh, what really happens is first they step away from their first restaurant because they're on the tour and the television and so forth. And they're building up and they have every right to do this. Everybody has a right to their own American dream. But then there's another restaurant. They open up another one. So they can't be in two places at once. But they do go, go back and forth. You know, there's one is on 8th Street and the other one is on 23rd Street. That's not so bad. <clears throat> then they open one in another con. Oh, you know, Me got a place in Mexico City now. I'm in Los Angeles and Mexico City. Easy flight. But we're also opening one in Dallas and another one in, um, in Miami where it's really hot and they're throwing lots of money at me to do it. So now you have four restaurants. Somebody like Jean-Georges von Gerichten, one of the most famous chefs in the world and considered one of the greatest chefs in the world, has 50 restaurants. How often do you think he ever goes or gets to oversee anything in 44 of them? We're talking about Bangkok. We're talking about Hong Kong. We're talking about New York. We're talking about Paris, London, and so forth and so on. Um, it just isn't possible physically to do so. He does not really know if the quality of produce that is coming in the, the back door is of the quality that he would approve in his own restaurant. Now, we'll say about Jean George, and I will say this about Wolfgang Puck. There's a higher chance that those two specific chefs. Uh, Wolfgang will probably be at Spago tonight, and Jean George will probably be at Jean George uh, in New York City tonight. Um, now, that means the other restaurants are kind of shortchanged, but um, they still believe that at their flagship restaurant, it's important for me to be here. If only, obviously, they're not cooking everything, obviously, they're cooking nothing when they're there, but they're hitting guys in the back of the head saying you're overcooking the pasta. Um, get that steak off right away. Where's, where, where's the where, where's table 14's asparagus? Right. But they do come out. I mean, everybody, when, that's, and that's the thing, too. You book a table at some famous chef's uh, restaurant that you've seen on, uh, seen on television. Tom Colicchio, Wolfgang Puck, Jean-Georges Wagner, Richten, Emeril Lagasse. And you book it, and you had to book six weeks in advance, and you're going to be in Las Vegas one night, and you go to the restaurant. So is Emeril coming out? <laughs> Better odds at the roulette table, pal. And that's ever going to happen. So that's kind of disappointing. Or if you were to go to Paris to something that might be considered the greatest restaurant in Paris, when was the last time uh, Chef So-and-so was here? Oh, Monsieur, you know, he comes in about once every six weeks or so. He's in Hong Kong right now. Come on. You know, the, the general manager of the Yankees and the, the, the conductor of the Philharmonic do not come by every six weeks during the season. Good point. Good point. But it, it, it's, it's not really... The quality of the food that suffers is it. It's really, it's really the overall operation. That and as you say, the spirit of it. If if you go to a restaurant and you know that famous chef is there that night, everybody, it's a big deal. Everybody knows it. You you know it as a guest. Mm -hmm. What? Who, forgive me for not remembering this guy. Extremely obese. Uh, American chef from New Orleans, Paul who Prud who Paul Prudhomme. Thank you, Paul Prudhomme. Mm -hmm. I we were on a shoot, and we went to his restaurant uh, one night. Got in just before closing, uh, where the line was only an hour, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and he was there, mm -hmm. and uh, his uh, was it called the Cajun Kitchen or something? I don't remember the name of it. Oh. A little. Kitchen, yeah. It was a little storefront, really plain as can be. I mean, it was, but it was a wonderful experience. But he was there, yes. and boy, was that a big deal to see him uh, roll through the restaurant and say hello to everybody. Um, other than having passed him in an airport one time, that's the only time I ever saw 
Paul Prudhomme who wasn't on the uh, on the television when he wasn't on TV. He was also mistaken for a jumbo jet when he was at the airports. So. <laughs> a year after you went there, and I'm assuming this is in the early to mid 80s, yes. he, he wouldn't have been there because he became so famous that he did nothing but the food cooking shows and so forth. He had his own TV show and he just left that that kitchen and it went downhill fast. It stayed open even after he died. Uh, about which was about seven or eight years ago, but it didn't stay open for long again because oh, this is called Paul Prudhomme's Kate Paul's Kitchen, but there is no Paul Prudhomme. No, there isn't. He's dead. Well, you know, why do I want to go? Um, but the the food and everything went downhill. I'll t I'll tell you the, my my favorite uh, Paul Prudhomme story. I was on assignment for Playboy to uh, go to the 25 greatest restaurants in America after we did a survey. And we do a survey of food critics and everybody, and uh, K. Paul show up on the list, something like number 11 or something like that. So I went. And as you know, John, it's communal seating. You don't get your own table, you know, unless you got six people for take over at one table. So, um, oh, hi, would you mind sitting with this uh, these two guys over here? And I said, not at all. There's two guys sitting there in T-shirts and gimme caps, and they're from Indiana or something. And, uh, hi, my name is John. What's your home? I'm, I'm Doug. And this is my brother, Doug, you know, so <laughs> these real salt of the earth guys. So I said, gentlemen, this is your lucky day. Said, Why is that? So a lot from Playboy magazine that, that elicited a she, <laughs> yeah. uh, and I am going to order everything on this menu and pay for it. That got a, Holy! <laughs> so those guys were in pig heaven, I'm sure. Not a day goes by they don't tell that story. How this guy from Playboy comes in, he owes the whole goddamn menu, and then pays for the whole thing. We have like six martinis each. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that, is, that is the equivalent of dying and go to heaven. Yeah. Kind of like when you and I dine out in Los Angeles there. It's always uh, it's always fun, and I even provide the women. <laughs> and John, uh, 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 John C. always likes how you always pick up the bill and order everything off the menu. Oh, it doesn't happen anymore with you, John. Well, it doesn't happen with me either because you know I, I used to be doing that for Esquire many magazines, and they're all out of business, and I don't have that kind of expense account uh, anymore. So I have to uh, watch my uh, budget. Okay, so yeah. maybe John, you'll you'll uh, John Coleman, you'll uh, you'll return the favor uh, this time. So I'll just... be happy to. It's when you come out to the West Coast, John. We'll go to Biggie's Hamburgers right down the street. They just <laughs> so, open up a new. Uh... As long as the Biggie's is good and the uh, they have my Dom Perignon on ice, I'll be fine. So just to take <laughs> us out of the gutter uh, for just a, a half a second as we uh, maybe close. So this is the year twenty twenty one. And you had mentioned Wolfgang Puck and maybe one or two other, uh, perhaps the names of the one or two uh, or three restaurants that you would go to almost any place that are owned and operated by one of these people where you know that you'll get a fairly decent chance at, at getting a really, really good meal. Well, I would certainly go to either one of those. I would also go to Alan Ducasse's restaurant in um, Paris. He's never there. But I mean, uh, they just really cracked the whip. I mean, you know, we're, we're talking about like probably, well, well I remember another place uh, there, which is the Bristol Hotel. They have 40 people in the kitchen. 40. Mm. And they only serve 80 people a day. 40 at dinner, 40, 40 at lunch, 40 at dinner. So that kind of guarantees consistency. I, I do like that. There's a place called Dal Pescatore, which is um, uh, has three Michelin stars, which is uh, family owned, and mo all, the whole family. Uh, it's outside of uh, Modena, outside of Milano, in Italy. And boy, that place is always, always good and cordial and wonderful and terrific. So yeah, I mean, there, I have favorite places like that. But the that, Dal Pescatore, they are always there. I've never been there when they haven't both been there. No, that's not true. And, and this is interesting. One time, the husband was there. The wife was doing a cooking demo somewhere in Milan, and the profuse apologies, the tears pouring out of their 
uh, the, their eyes that uh, that she was not there and was were they embarrassing themselves. I mean, it was so sweet. Food as good as ever. Mm. <laughs> John, thank you so much for this perspective on uh, great restaurants, big name chefs. Oh, I should also, uh, Art, say that uh, Oscar Wilde once said, you know, we are all in the gutter, but some of us are looking at the stars. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, John. Thank you, John. And thank you, everybody out there. Uh, see you soon. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.